that still comes down to the person taking the x-ray. Because if you're not using the right technique, you can have the best device in the world, but it's the person who presses the button that determines the quality of the radiograph. When someone tells me, well, I don't have the money to invest in that kind of technology. I'm like, show me a dentist that doesn't have $200 because you show me like a broken cusp on a tooth and I'm gonna say, please get me a crown on that tooth before it continues to break down. It takes one patient to pay for that one intraoral camera. That being said, I'm still a citizen of the state of Iowa who advocates for public health and patient awareness. So you have to play both sides of the card. And I tell the students that if, if you're not going to advocate for the patients when something like that goes on, who is? Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Hey everyone, welcome back to A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode 255. If you're new to this podcast, there is usually two of us. This is Michelle. Andrew is not on this particular one because this is a holiday week and we're going to all kind of enjoy the holiday. I hope everyone has a fantastic Thanksgiving. And for you non-US people, I hope you just have a great Thursday if you're not celebrating Thanksgiving. But I hope everyone's doing it super responsibly and wearing masks and socially distancing and all of that jazz because my gosh, we have an issue. And I'm really hoping we don't go back into lockdowns and stuff like that. So everybody just be super responsible. I also wanted to tell you that I'm super excited to share this episode with you. This is all on radiology and imaging with the one and only Emily Bogey, who is a return guest. Thank you so much to Emily for continuing to say yes every time I'm like, ah, I, need, I want this topic. Can somebody come on and talk about it? I can't find anybody. And she's like, I got it. Don't worry. And I'll tell you guys right now, I have, I did this episode, we recorded it a few weeks ago, and I wouldn't say I was terrible at x-rays. I think I'm actually pretty decent at it. Um, I'm pretty okay with I imaging. I'm really fast to whip out my intraoral camera and all of that, but after this episode, I really kind of cleaned some things up and I made sure about my, you know, technique. And I actually was like, hmm, I wonder if this would be a better bisecting technique. Um, and I actually implemented some of the things that we talk about this on a patient I ha uh, saw that had um, some bone loss and some early peri implantitis around an implant. And I'm always striving to get those implant threads as level as possible so that I can kind of count them and really keep that as my baseline. And so I did a few images so that I could find the best way to get that x-ray and then I documented it. And so I was really excited about that. But I think you guys are really gonna enjoy this recap and review and maybe for some of you students, but as you're in radiology, uh, maybe it's gonna be uh, a nice little, I don't know, helpful tips and uh, hints for you guys that are in the course right now. But enjoy this interview with Emily Bogey. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Well, listeners, um, we have um, a return guest that's probably just going to get like an honorary uh, physician <laughs> with a tail and two hygiene. <laughs> we have a few of you that deserve this like honorary co-host title. But one of my favorites, Emily Bogey, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I love being on the podcast. I'm kind of I'm kind of one of you guys' groupies. I follow you around. Listen to all the podcasts. Um, ditto. Yeah. That we're, we, anytime we can be a part of the bogey entourage, we're there for it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh, shoot. So we are going to talk about a topic that I will be very honest about. I have not, outside of me being in school while the 
or being a faculty member in a program that teaches radiology and helping in a clinical situation, not so much the didactic side of it, I have not taken an update on radiology. And that's what I want to talk with. And you give a course, an amazing course, and you are in a state that requires this course for, is it for hygienists and assistants or just assistants? Right. So Iowa requires mandatory training, like a lot of a lot of um, states require training for all dental professionals. But for dental assistants who are qualified radiology um, dental assistants, they have to get recertified every two years. So they have to take two hours of CE every two years, specifically on radiology. But a lot of times when folks go as a team to take the state required CEs, I give what I call the five hour power pack. And that has jurisprudence, which is one hour, two hours of infection control, and then two hours of radiology. And a lot of offices will come and they'll attend all five hours. So it's really cool because then the same, the team is hearing all the same consistent information and I update it every time I give it. But it's interesting because radiology doesn't really update a lot. I mean, yeah, when you talk about the differences between digital and film-based radiology, you're going to get a lot of updates there. But in terms of like overall anode to cathode conductivity, all that kind of stuff, (laughs) it's the same inside the machine as what it's always been. But in addition to the continuing education being required, the state of Iowa has, you know, specific things that they want you to cover. They want you to cover the history of radiation and they want you to cover radiation safety, especially. So seems, seems reasonable. Yeah. The safety part. (laughs) Yeah. I try to keep mine kind of light. You know, we go through history of radiation and that's kind of the same every time, but then we go into some updates and then some safety updates and just general questions that people have. And keep it as light as possible. I mean, it's not the most exciting topic. Oh, I will admit that, (laughs) but it is good to have an update periodically. Absolutely. And we're going to get in some techniques and things like that. Um, The reason that I kind of selfishly wanted to have this course and wanted somebody who teaches radiology to come on because I was just joking the other day, when I left my full-time practice, we were using uh, phosphor plates. Mm -hmm. And I loved them, though there was this extra step to go, quote unquote, develop them in the the scanner machine. It was so lovely to have that thinner plate with uh, tori and with people who gagged and all that stuff, right? So now that I'm like a full digital sensor, I I keep joking, like I haven't seen the distal of a canine in a hot minute. (laughs) Right. And so I we teach phosphor plates because the students need to learn to mount the film mounts on the computer and they need to learn that, you know, they're, you can flip an image around and all that kind of stuff and how it's important to have um, that facial mounting. But this is our first year with digital wired sensors. And I really, I mean, I enjoy the phosphor plates, but I will say the sensors I practiced with for 12 years and I, I miss my sensor something fierce, but I will say... I can't imagine learning and not having the phosphor plate because it is so important to get those angles down and get the basics of angulation and what does parallel mean and what does perpendicular mean. And when you're trying, you know, when you're taking a diagnostic PA of the premolars, you need to have the distal of that canine or it's not diagnostic. And so especially early on with the students, those phosphor plates become very valuable. We were the last state, pardon me, the last college in the state of Iowa to get rid of our processors completely. So um, no one else is using the actual films in radio, oral radiology education anymore. But it's so expensive to run those processors for the small amount of time that you need to run them every fall. And so you're paying for all these chemicals that you only really use for like a month and a half. And they're not safe to have around anyway. And they're not, it's just not cost effective. And so I'm glad we got rid of the processors. But at the same time, we still have to teach all of that processing, all the, all the steps because it's still on boards. Yes. Oh, God bless. So let's talk about that not diagnostic part of it. So, okay. If I'm taking an FMX or full mouth series or however you, whatever acronym you play with in your practice. FMX is the the, um, ADA acronym. 
ADA. Okay. So if I'm taking a full mouth series um, and I get the distal, if I get a beautiful view of the canine on an anterior PA, no overlap, would that still count? Well, it, when you're grading a full mouth series, you're grading per film. But from a diagnostic standpoint, if you catch it on another film on the full mouth series, the series is in, in its entirety. So you wouldn't retake it from a radiation safety perspective. But at the same time, it's very important when you're first learning how to take x-rays that you learn correctly. And so that's why we're always on on that. Well, this is a diagnostic because it doesn't have the area of interest that it needs to have. We only retake images if you can't see it somewhere else. But it has to have an open contact, too, because I've seen some really good canine images, anterior canine images, but then they don't have the open contact. And then, you know, that's the value of getting that canine on the premolar image. Okay, very good. I'm going to just skip all the other stuff and just dive straight into technique and we'll just circle back to (laughs) the other stuff. But do you have any tips and tricks for patients with uh, tori? Tori, you know, I I like the the snap array. When you're using phosphor plates, it's sometimes the snap array can be a little too aggressive on the phosphor plate, but they make they make a spongier snap array now that can be used with a digital X-ray sensor. The important thing to say that to say about the snap array is you you really should be bisecting the angle when you're using that snap array because it's really hard to get that parallel. You just don't have the biting space on that, the biting block on the XCP. I love the snap array for people who had tori because you could kind of put it where you needed to have it grab and then adjust the sensor or the phosphor plate accordingly. But yeah, when it comes to tori, a lot of the students want to put all kinds of padding on the x-ray. And I think the more padding you put on it, the more pressure you're going to get on that tori. It's kind of like when someone has a very shallow floor of the mouth and they want to put all this cotton in there, or all this padding in there. And I'm like, well, all you're doing is increasing the amount of stuff that poor patient with a small mouth has to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. I've become a real fan of um, just the sticky tabs. I have too. I, I, it does set you up for a cone cut if you're not really good. But man, I, I just, I've really grown to like those. And they're so much uh, less bulky and big in the patient's mouth. And I told the students actually just this afternoon in clinic, I'm like, if you can use just one of those, like even if you take a quarter of one of those sticky bite wing tabs and you stick the, the phosphor plate onto the XCP block so it doesn't wiggle around in there, especially when you're placing it really far back for a molar, then the the phosphor plate isn't going to be moving around in there. So that's always the challenge. You get that really skinny phosphor plate. You had mentioned how it's so skinny and it's it fits so well, but then that skinniness doesn't always like to stay in the XCP holder. And so they get frustrated with that too. And I always tell them those, you know, if you use a quarter of a bite wing tab, that's the cheapest way, man. I will never complain <laughs> about overusing those sticky bite, bite wing tabs as long as you um, take it off before you throw it in this in the sterilizer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they don't always peel all that paper off. And then I get it out. and I'm like, dang it, there's paper on here. And then you got to peel it all off and put it back through. So you mentioned bisecting and you mentioned parallel. Can we get a recap what all of that means and what that technique looks like? So paralleling is when the way I explain it to the students is if you we always talk about the long axis of the tooth. If you put the tooth on a stick like it's a popsicle where the popsicle stick would go in. So like your popsicle didn't melt unevenly. See what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the long axis of the tooth. If you can get that popsicle stick right in there, that's the long axis of the tooth. So if you can make the phosphor plate or the sensor to be straight, like parallel, the two L's and the, and the word parallel are straight with each other. So if you can make that popsicle stick straight with the sensor or the phosphor plate, then you can also make the end of the PID, the end of your x-ray machine, that circle also straight with those two things. So you have the straight film, the straight long axis of the tooth, the straight end of your x-ray beam, that's paralleling. Then you take the central beam that comes out of the middle of the x-ray machine 
and you make that go right through all three of the, those things at a right angle. The key to x-ray, to understanding anything in x-ray, is to understand parallel versus perpendicular. Perpendicular is when you come at something square. So like when you are driving and you come to a four-way intersection, the two roads are perpendicular to each other. Whereas if you're two roads that are running continuous with each other and never intersect, those are parallel. And I think that that is the hardest part for students in hygiene, in my opinion. I know it was one of the hardest things for me to understand. If I could understand parallel and I can understand perpendicular, I can teach anybody to take an x-ray. Because for instance, if you keep the occlusal plane parallel to the floor, then you're always going to have that perfect straight bite wings all the way across. Your occlusal plane will be parallel. But you get a problem when the patient starts tipping their chin toward the ceiling or tipping their chin toward the floor. And then all of a sudden your bite wings look like they're all wonky because you didn't keep your patient's occlusal plane parallel to the floor. And so if you can understand the concepts of parallel and the concept of perpendicular, I can teach you all kinds of things about taking an x-ray. Now, the next step in that is paralleling is considered the gold standard. So getting that long axis of the tooth parallel to the film and being able to get the end of your PID parallel to those, then you're going to have that the closest to a one-to-one -one representation on an x-ray that you can. You're not going to have distortion because then you're not going to have foreshortening or elongation. If you can get that beam to go right through and come at a 90 degree angle through the tooth and then through to the film, then you're not going to have a tooth that looks like it's a different size than the x-ray, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely does. And I see that to be very true when I'm taking images uh, for implants, because I'm always trying to get that dental implant very parallel so that I can count the threads and I can actually see the thread and it's not kind of like a little, you know, up or down and it starts to like fade into the next threads because I personally like to count the threads to always confirm that there's, there hasn't been any bone loss. And that's another thing I cover um, on my updated radiology program is we, we talk a lot about 3D CBCT machines and how much more accurate the 3D CBC machine CBCT machines are when you start to talk about implants. The reason why they are so accurate is because it's taking something that's 3D, the teeth and the structure around the teeth, and it's representing them in 3D on a CBCT. Whereas a periapical x-ray, a bite wing x-ray, a cephalometric x-ray, a panoramic x-ray, they're all taking something that's 3D and they're putting it on a 2D. So you're taking something that has roundness per se, or has dimension, and you're squishing it on something that's flat. And anytime that you do that, you're going to have distortion. I don't care how good you are. You're, you're going to have some level of distortion. And there are certain companies that will say, you know, we have the least distortion, which maybe they do have less distortion than their competitor, but it still comes down to the person taking the x-ray. Because if you're not using the right technique, you can have the best device in the world, but it's the person who presses the button that determines the quality of the radiograph. I think that's why CBT, CBCT, I never can say that correctly. I know. Cold <laughs> beam computer beam. tomography, CBCT. That's why it's so, um, <laughs> when, when a person sits in that machine, it's, they have to sit in a certain way. So they're almost like they're, they're not locked in the machine, but they're in a very precise measurement. And you can line that Frankfurt plane up. You can line all the different lights up. And then when you take the image, it's going to be a very accurate representation because it's going all the way around their head. And so when you're talking about 2D objects, yes, it's, it's significantly less radiation in millisieverts, but you're getting much more information and you're getting much more accurate one-to-one -one level representation with the cone beam computer tomography than you are with the traditional. Yeah, it's so very cool to see one of those CBCTs. Oh yeah, I love them. They're awesome. I practiced with them for a lot of years before I got an education. Now I can't afford one. <laughs> <laughs> they are not cheap. That's the truth. Oh, no. They're not cheap to get. They're not cheap to do or to own. Well, and then once you own them, you have to be accountable for whatever's on the image. 
So if you take a CBCT, then um, I know I worked at a practice where we would send them to the university if the patient wanted, you know, to have them read. We would always say we have up to a certain level of capability to read this, but to get a full radiographic reading, we would send them to the oral radiologist down at the university. And then the patient would pay a pretty nominal fee. We would send them electronically. The radiologist would read them and send them back. Because you have to be accountable. If you're going to take the image, you have to be accountable for what's on the image. Exactly. And that's where, I, I mean, and you teach ethics and stuff. I think that's where your code of ethics really comes into play because I've heard a lot of people are like, oh, well, you could also, like giving an option, you could also pay for it. And then the patient not realizing that they probably should take that option, that nominal fee could diagnose something very early on, you know, God forbid it's on there and they have an issue and they're like, ah, no. And the doc's like, ah, okay. And it's like, sometimes you got to hold their hand. The folks I worked with, um, the, the dentists that I worked with when I, when I practiced in private practice, um, they were amazing. And they would be like, you know, I'm kind of seeing something in your sinuses. It might just be that kind of year, you know, that time of year allergy season, but it might be something you need to be worried about. And they would be the first people to admit, like, I am not an oral radiologist. And so they would be like, you can either pay this fee and have them read it. And my employer would say, oh, well, a lot of times it's a mucus retention cyst or something like that, where you don't really need to worry about it, but it's up to you. And then if the patient didn't want to send it in, we would have them sign a waiver saying, I'm waiving my right to send this in. And it would really only take a couple seconds. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, another thing I have to have the patient fill out. But it was like one signature and done. And it was standard process. So like just another thing, this is what we do. Okay, you don't want it, sign it, send it away. Or okay, you do want it, okay. Then we'll bill it out. Cool, awesome, move on. So I am curious, um, what are your thoughts on, because I have not personally had a um, very good experience and I'm sure it comes down to machine and also clinician running that machine, but bite wings on a Panorex. You know, I, I have not had a lot of experience, to be honest. I've only had, um, the only time I've ever done that bite wings on a Panorex thing was two years at the Mission or Mercy where they were doing it. And I wasn't really looking at them too closely. I was exposing them and then sending them with the patient on. But from what I've heard, the bite wing information is just extracted out of the information that's gathered for the panoramic. And I don't know a lot about how that all works. Um, but yeah, that would be, I, I've heard about it. I know people do it. I mean, I've also heard offices that will charge for the pano and then charge for the bite wings that's off the pano. Woof. And that's the part I don't quite know. I know I was giving an ethics course and somebody asked me what my opinion of that would be from an ethics standpoint, because technically the patient is paying for the interpretation of the radiograph. So if, if the individual is taking the time to read the panoramic and then they're also taking the time to read the bite wings, then I would feel that would be ethical. But if they would just, every time they took a pano, charge out the bite wings too and not read the bite wings, I think that would be the ethical dilemma in the discussion. But again, I wasn't there, so I don't know what happened. But but yeah, I think if you're going to take the pano and extract the information for the bite wings, then the discussion would be making sure that they get read. And they're readable. Right. Because that's been my issue. I'm like, I don't see it as clear. Now, I'm sure things have probably come a long way since uh, the three years ago when I was doing this, but I was always like, let me just get a sensor in their mouth. Let's just. Yeah. And you had talked about bisecting a little bit. And that's something that, you know, I was just talking to my students. I just taught that last week, two weeks ago now. Oh my gosh, all my weeks are running together two weeks ago now. And the students were like, Mrs. Bogey, this is so hard. Why would we ever do this? And I'm like, well, I can probably count on two hands how many times I've ever had to bisect the angle. But when I needed to bisect the angle, I was very happy that I knew how. And so you talk about bisecting the angle and when do you have to do that? You technically should be bisecting the angle anytime that you can't get the film parallel with the long axis of the tooth. So back to that whole tooth on a popsicle stick, anytime you can't put the film in there so it's parallel with that long axis of the tooth, it's not as hard as people make it sound. You just take the angle 
that's created that isn't parallel, you divide it in half, so half the angle, and you make the end of your cone parallel with half the angle between where the tooth is and the film. You pick halfway between and you make the end of your cone parallel with halfway between. And so, you know, I, I do a lot of um, visualization with the students when they first learn that. And when you read it in a book, it sounds very complicated. But if you just sit the student down and be like, no, this, this right here, my hand is the angle that you need to be parallel with. Because I, I'm not good at math, so I, I'm a visual person. Like if you tell me I have to take half of the 45 degree angle and that's a 22 degree angle and then make that 22 degree angle parallel with, no, I don't want any of that crap. No way. <laughs> show me a pie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Show me the pie. <laughs> then we'll talk about fractions. <laughs> we'll talk about fractions. We'll talk about, <laughs> we'll talk about the angle I need to make to get a bigger piece of the pie. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Another interesting thing with um, my uh, radiology lecture is it's evolved into a radiology and imaging sciences lecture. Okay. Because I, I talk about not only radiology, but then you talk about imaging in general. So like photographs, the importance of having photographs on every patient and having a basic intraoral collection of images on every single patient. And um, the British Dental Journal back in 2009 was one research study that I read that they said that there's eight essential images that every single patient should have in their chart, like actual photographic images. And I remember when I was in practice and we would take these photographic images and somebody would run down to the drugstore, get them developed and bring them back. And we put them in the patient's chart. Shut your mouth. I'm not even oh kidding. And now we just click, 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 click. And it's done. Oh my gosh. And my students, you know, we do that at school too. So we take, um, you know, intro images and I, I don't know how, how brand namey I can get here with my shout out, but like mouthwatch, I'm sorry, but you cannot get a better dang camera for that amount of money, like that you can put in someone's mouth and that you can disinfect. And I mean, you don't have to have a fancy, fancy camera to be able to get high quality intro images. If you want a fancy camera, there's fancy cameras that have all kinds of other capabilities that have infrared technology. They have the ability to assist you in detecting precancerous lesions. I mean, all those, those that's amazing capability. But when someone tells me, well, I don't have the money to invest in that kind of technology. I'm like, show me a dentist that doesn't have $200 because you show me like a broken cusp on a tooth and I'm going to say, please get me a crown on that tooth before it continues to break down. It takes one patient to pay for that one intraoral camera. You definitely bring a great point to that ROI. And I would even say I have had, so I've disclosed recent, well, in the last few years, every single patient, everybody gets disclosed with um, the triplac gel. And I show them, I take the intraoral camera and I'm very lucky. I have a monitor that's attached to my chair in the front of it. And then one behind me as well. And I just I'll pop that up on the screen and I take the intraoral pictures in the moment. And then I, I, I give them a mirror and we look together with the mirror and we go through brushing instructions and all the OHI. But when I sit them up, those are still there for them to see. And they're always like, oh, and I swear, it's like, I say it in my lecture all the time. And I was like, I really wish I could record every single patient because this is no lie. They're always like, I better not see any of that purple next time I come back in here. And I'm like, mm -hmm. or they say, put it away. Me either, Joe. It's like, it's your me mouth, either. dude. You're looking at your mouth. Don't look at me like yeah. I'm the bad guy. You tell me to put away no, the but pictures. It's, <laughs> it's your mouth. And I say that in a way that um, isn't them like being upset, but them taking accountability which I find to be just fascinating because I definitely did not disclose for a solid, a solid 12 years of my- Yeah, we use this. Where did that disclosing agent go? I just had a bottle of it on my desk. Um, it's so amazing. Yeah, it's good like, stuff. It, and then like you talk about the, the capabilities now with the even more- um, involved type of scanning machines where they have they have true color representation on a scanning machine and the amount of education that can be given to a patient when you just scan their whole mouth with a digital scanner and then they see all of the plaque 
I mean, disclosing and taking intraoral pictures is awesome. But if you have that capability to go one step further, do it. It's so cool. It's and I know I just had um, I just had a crown prep done a couple of weeks ago and they did um, they scanned my mouth. And seriously, it took nine seconds to do my home off. It blows my mind. It's amazing, especially when you use things like ScanMate and you depending on what I don't I haven't I've never scanned anybody's mouth. I hate to even say that. Oh, like, it's I don't so have cool. a scanner. I've never been in an office. I've always tried to play with them at the conventions and I go and I mess around with them. But that's the extent of it. And I want I want to be so proficient at it. And I don't think I'll ever get to I keep so going cool. to these outreach programs <laughs> like public health. <laughs> But then the next thing I talk about when I when I do a radiology lecture is I talk about different um, digital technologies that are available, like Diagnodent, which Diagnodent is using um, special infrared light that shines a light into the tooth and it reflects back how calcified the tooth is. Or like Carry View, Dexis makes a product called Carry View that shines a bright light and are approximately for people who are x-ray haters. So you can still try your best to detect their interproximal caries using a bright light and a camera captures that image where it's dark in the areas where where the caries are interproximally. We talk about different digital oral cancer detection modalities and imaging science with that, you know, identify and valscope and all those precancerous and oral cancer detection modalities. And then I go into all the health and safety stuff, you know, Radiation exposure health is so important. And people don't realize that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has a component in that regulation of of radiation. And devices have to be FDA approved in order to be allowed to be used. And so things like portable handheld x-ray equipment... It, it's, a, it's a controversial discussion right now because there's a lot of portable handheld x-ray equipment that's not made in the United States that's making its way into the United States and they're not shielded and they're not, I'll, I'll make a blanket statement, they're not safe. I mean, if something has not gone through FDA testing and not deemed safe, in my opinion, it's unsafe until someone deems it safe. And maybe that's that's not the right opinion to have, maybe, but that's the way I always I always think about things. Yeah. Well, I practice more in that precautionary principle area where I take caution until it's proven. And I, I play this with the dental implant game. So if there isn't some instrument or whatever that has shown to has been shown to be safe on the dental implant i don't just make assumptions that it'll be fine so i practice the precautionary principle and i think that that falls very true for these handheld x-ray units and i try to walk that fine line of you maybe they're fine maybe maybe the ones that are being brought into the country are fine and they're safe and someone has checked them But until the FDA gives the company the clearance, until they've jumped through all the hoops, especially in an academic environment, we can't allow that. And then the other side of that is whether your state practice act is allowing that, because in certain states, they those handheld units are okay, And in other states, you know, there's regulation that you have to make sure that you're following because I'm I'm up here in Iowa and so there's certain things that we have to be following one of those things is that the Iowa Department of Public Health um has a bureau of radiological health and they have to come and check your machines every 4 years and your machines are I'm sorry I said that incorrectly you have to have your machines checked and then if if you get audited then you have to be able to prove that someone came and checked your machines keep your paperwork and such but it has to be done and it's written right in right in the Iowa law. And so knowing your state law is very important because you have to stay safe. And and that's how they're keeping the citizens of your your state safe. That's a great point. And with those handheld um, ones, there are quite a lot of, uh, I guess, false info kind of going around. Um, I tell you what, I got myself in trouble a few years ago. I was at the Iowa Mission of Mercy and a couple of the handheld units were donated. I won't talk brand, but um, 
they asked me as an educator to take some training to teach the people who were working at the Mission of Mercy how to use them. And so I took the training and I felt I was pretty competent. So I was showing people how to use them. Well, someone took a picture of me and posted it on Facebook of me using a handheld x-ray unit. And I'm so tall. And they called me out because they're like, you're beyond the safe zone based on your height. Oh, and the way I was standing. Because there's a way for you with your height to do that. Right. right? If, if I kind of contort myself and make sure I'm behind the zone of, a, of safety. Exactly. But there's a learning curve with that. And, and with me just learning how to use it, I was using it and I wasn't paying attention. Someone snapped a picture of me. And although I'm not really all that worried about it, because who was I harming? I was harming me. Over time, I can see how that could become an issue. And it's just like anything else in dentistry. You have to be trained on it and then you have to become proficient and then you have to know what you're doing with it and pay attention. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's the key. Like there's a lot of things where if, if people were to, were to take pictures of us working, especially with ergonomics, man, I would, I would get called out a lot. But it's, it's the safety discussion is so important because ra radiation is cumulative, right? And so when you live in a state like I do with the high radon levels and on the national average, when you're, when you're saying about 33 to 37% of your radiation exposures coming from the radon in the ground in an average state, and then you look at the radon map and Iowa is just like bright red on the radon map. So even more of ours is coming from the ground. You have to put some safety into perspective. And although dental radiographs are very, very safe, there are certain precautions you need to take, especially if you're of childbearing age. And especially if, you know, you have radiation coming from other sources. So if you're going through cancer chemotherapy treatment, if you're, and the same thing with your patients, if you have a patient who is a radiologist, then you need to take that into, into account when you're recommending x-rays for them. So always recommending the x-rays based on need and based on the patient's cumulative dosage rather than arbitrarily, oh, bite wings are covered every year under your policy or every six months under your policy, making sure that you're following that 2012, the dental radiographic examinations recommendations for patient selection and limiting radiation exposure. I always call it the ADA 2012 document because it's got like <laughs> a 10 mile long name, but that's the last time it was updated was 2012. And that you know, that, that's when they outline the parameters of the importance of patient selection and the importance of having limiting patient radiation exposure based on their need and having the importance of having guidelines for your equipment selection and having quality assurance. But the interesting thing about that document is they tried to standardize the training and education criteria for someone to be able to take x-rays, but it was a national level document made by the ADA and the um, FDA, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under the FDA. And so you had a national level organization trying to come up with some type of education standard when each state has a different practice act and each state is allowing different levels of people to take radiographs. Right, right. And so I'm curious, you being an educator and probably teaching your students exactly to, you know, that document that we're not, is not a year since their last set of bite wings, let's go ahead and get those kind of situation. Do you also give them advice on if they go into that practice that's like, oh, well, their insurance pays it for it every six months, every year, every whatever. And that's the standard. So we teach the radiation safety, the standard as low as reasonably achievable. So you're always using the least amount of radiation, regardless of image type, the least amount of radiation to have the most beneficial diagnostic quality for that patient that that patient needs. And one part of that is if that patient hasn't had a cavity in five years, how much of a need do they have for bite wings every year? And so I think it's important to have standard practices in an office. I don't, I don't want to argue that, but radiation is something that is an individual basis. And so I, we do tell the students that radiation has to be per patient. And the other thing, you know, I've 
I've had students call me back, like I'm working for a dentist that has me take a full mile series every year. Do you think that's excessive? My response to that is it sounds excessive to me, but perhaps their patients have a greater need. Are you in a geriatric practice where maybe there are some predisposing factors where they would need more x-rays than what was standard when we were in school and we were teaching you. So I always try to give the benefit of the doubt because again, you're not there, you're not seeing the patients, you're not, and I'm not a dentist, so I'm not the one who's prescribing the x-rays. That being said, I'm still a citizen of the state of Iowa who advocates for public health and patient awareness. So you have to play both sides of the card. And I tell the students that if, if you're not going to advocate for the patients when something like that goes on, who is? Oh, so true. And sometimes give the person prescribing the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes you see the chart more than that doctor does. So then you need to say, oh, I noticed they haven't had a cavity in six years. So and then you just kind of leave <laughs> or it perio or whatever it is. But there's also people who have very are very prone to caries like me. And like people would think, oh, she's a hygienist. I I don't want to expose her any more than because she's around radiation all the time. But then I say, I have a really high caries rate and I have some very large fillings in my mouth. And so I've seen both sides of it. But I think that having conversations, critical conversations are so important in our industry. And I think that working with people who are mature enough to allow those critical conversations to happen, because I mean, obviously you're not going to say ahead of the patient oh, you know, this and this and this, we shouldn't be doing that. But like just saying, hey, after work, can I ask you a couple questions about radiographs? Because I'm not quite sure I'm understanding if for some patients we're doing them for the reasons that I think we should be doing them. Maybe I'm confused. So like flipping it around, like not like you can't, you can't, but help me to understand how we can be better for, you know, for radiation safety. That's such a great point. It all goes back to communication and critical thinking. Right. It goes a long way because I think it's really easy to point fingers in practice, but it's more difficult to have critical conversations and to take the time to communicate. And that's why people don't do it because it's more difficult. And it's like the path of least least resistance. I'll just complain. I'll leave that problem at work and then I'll come back and forget about it tomorrow. But long term, it solves things so much better if you just have the discussion that you should be having. So true. I love that you're including imaging because that's, I guess I never put those two in the same category. It makes complete sense that they should be in the same category. So is that the extent of all the imaging that you go through. So we have radiology, we have our intraoral cameras and extraoral cameras. You, you know, can take those shots. I do the oral cancer modality. I do the infrared technology. I talk about, have you seen the inflammation camera? I don't know if anyone, um, the one I'm very familiar with is the one from Acteon. I have not. They have a camera that can detect inflammation in the tissue. What? It's really cool. It's really cool. Like, uh, what do they call it? Thermo? um... Basically, yeah, like thermal inflammatory activity. Thing. Yes. And so like when people do those full body scans and you can see, ah, that's very cool. It's really cool. And especially around implants, like peri-implantitis, you had mentioned implants earlier. I was playing around with it. I can't remember what meeting it was last year, but it was super cool. And I don't know if it's proprietary with Acteon or not, but I know their camera was really neat. I was, I was checking it out. But the imaging sciences, and some people say, no, radiation is by itself because, you know, it's it's a whole nother level of ionization and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But ultimately, if you show people the picture, they're going to understand. I'm such a believer in that. If I take an image, I show the patient, whether it's a radiograph, if it's an intraoral image, if it's Carrie's view image, whatever it is, I show the patient because first of all, they're going to pay for it. So I like to show people the value in what we're doing, but it makes so much more sense. Like if you tell someone you broke the distal buckle cusp off of number 14, like I did on a cheese lid a couple weeks ago when I got my crown print, then I think I know what that means. But if somebody were like, oh, you broke the cusp off your tooth. But then when you show me a picture of it and I see that fill it, there's already 75% composite resin filling in that tooth. Now I've broken the only natural part of that tooth off. So of course I'm going to say whatever you have to take to fix it. Like it makes sense. 
And I, th- I think sometimes we as dental professionals get so involved in the semantics of, is the patient going to like, is the patient going to accept treatment? Is the patient going to get mad at me? Is the patient going to say it's going to cost too much money? Whatever excuse they're going to give, or is the patient going to say they don't have time to fix it? Well, maybe you should just show the patient what's going on and let the patient decide. And it's really beautiful to put that radiograph and that intraoral side by side, just for even our own diagnostics and our own like note keeping, record keeping. It's great. And not to mention the patient is going to value that so much and their insurance company when they see a tooth that's 75 percent filling and has the natural tooth structure broke off. They pretty much can't deny them coverage because that's that's <laughs> right. a mess. I mean, I'm sure my insurance company got that and they're like, that's a mess. She needs a crown. Like so, someone help that girl. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's so much value that can be placed on imaging, not just radiographs, imaging in general. And with the technology that's out there, it's amazing. So yeah, I guess. Do we do we cover some of your your conundrums? Do you not feel like you haven't had radiology training in a while now? Well, I'm I'm actually very happy with how quickly that all came back to me, especially the bisecting. Because someone else said that the other day, and I was like, bisecting. It's all coming back. It's all coming back to you. Exactly. Yeah. Girl, yes, yeah, sing it, sing it. Yes, exactly. The only thing that I want to remember. Can you remind me, is it the slob rule? Slob rule? Stop it right now. I can't believe I remembered that. (laughs) It's uh, the slob rule is same lingual, opposite buckle. So what you do is if you take an image and you see an artifact on the image, this has never happened to me. Honestly, this never happened to me, but somebody told me that they never used the slob rule until they broke a cure rat on a patient. Yeah. And the curette was subject, the curette tip was subgingival and they were going to try to fish it out, but they needed to know if it went to the buckle or to the lingual. So what you do is you take an x-ray of the area, take a radiograph, parallel PA works the best. And then you either change the horizontal angulation. So you take another x-ray from the mesial or you take the ver- change the vertical angulation and you go either up or down. You just have to remember in which direction you moved your tube head and you have to move your tube head in a manner that you make a significant change. So if the image moves in the same direction as you moved your tube head, then the artifact is on the lingual. If the image moves in the opposite direction that you moved your tube head, then it's on the buckle. Same lingual, opposite buckle. Who thought of that? Like, I'm always like, who screwed up? (laughs) And what did they have to go fish out? And they're like, oh, interesting. This thing moved. I I mean, you'd have to do that multiple times. Or maybe it's just physics. I don't know. Maybe it's just. Well, and the funny thing is I teach slob rule the week after I teach occlusal radiographs. And the student's like, why wouldn't you just take an occlusal radiograph and you could see if it was buckle or lingual? And I'm always like, oh, my God, you paid attention. I love you right now. (laughs) You paid attention. You did it. I don't even know. Like, we don't even have occlusal images or occlusal uh, films or sensors. (laughs) You can use a number two to do an occlusal image. Do you think that would work? I guess if you're just looking for that one. Yeah. One little spot there. I'm thinking like the ones that children bite on. As long as you use the right angulation. Yeah. So good point. You got to bisect the ankle sometimes with the occlusal, too. I I used to use slob a lot in surgery. Oh, yeah. I guess I never worked in surgery. Yeah, just, I mean, because we did a lot of bone grafting and we would use the screws for scaffolding and the screws to um, what we used to call like the J blocks, like the giant, giant chunks of bone to build a ridge. Well, before we had CBCT, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We used it a lot because we were always like, where is that screw? (laughs) Do we need to flap it back on the lingual or flap it on the facial? Where are we flapping this back? <laughs> oh, wow. But I had always forgotten what it always stood for. So um, that was great. But yeah, I think that that covered everything. If you um, are a listener and you're screaming at the radio or your phone or whatever right now, like, ask this. Don't worry. You can always send us a message and um, we will 
annoy Bogey and her. And Michelle can ask the expert that she has on next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you are so great. I know. I was so glad to have you on. You're so busy. So when I asked you and you're like, oh, I'm just slammed but I'll do it. I was like, no, don't, well, don't do it. And then you're like, I can do it. This stinking doctorate thing is kind of like messing up my universe, but I have two more classes and then I'm all but dissertation. So it'll be good. Ah, I'm so glad that you were able to come back on and thank you for all this great info. If people do want to reach out, how can they do that? Well, they can email me, emily.bogey at hawkeyecollege.edu or emily at thinkbigdental.com. Or if you Google B-O-G-E and dental, I mean, enough people have my number that you could probably find me. <laughs> Send a carrier <laughs> pigeon to Iowa. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, this has been so fantastic. I always love having you on. We'll have to send you an honorary co-host badge forever. I um, just want Andrew to sing me to sleep some night. So whenever he gets that done. Um, and if you guys did not know, Andrew and Emily are in constant competition for best hugs. Oh, oh, there's no competition. I beat him <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> constant competition. It's so fantastic. And um, Bogey came with me to Nicaragua once. And hopefully one day when we can travel again and the world is... Back to whatever norm we will then be calling it. I hope we can go on another one. Yes, I'm there, dude. After the COVID, as people are saying. Uh, after, after the Rona. After the Rona's over. All right. Well, thanks for having on me. Having me on. Having on me. Okay. There you go. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> right, see you later. Well, I hope you guys really enjoyed that. I'm sure you took lots of pearls. It's always nice to have a review. You know, I'm fit. 15 plus years into this and my gosh i needed that review i'm not in a state that does require that yet for radiology but i wouldn't hate it i'll tell you that and if you guys did not already know this you could get ce credit for that episode and a lot of our episodes thanks to pdt if you are not familiar pdt makes some fantastic instruments and you should definitely check that out at pdtdental.com and you can also head over to our instagram your tail to hygienist and check out some igtvs where i show you some of my favorite instruments from pdt they're good people who make amazing instruments and we are so grateful to them for continuing to sponsor this free ce for you guys and if you don't already, follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and please share this. We have always grown so organically because of you guys, because you continue to download and tell your friends. So thank you so very much for doing that. We hope you have a great holiday and please send us a message over at a tale of two hygienists.com and subscribe to our newsletter. All right. I think that's it. Bye y'all.